We've got all got to agree to it. Well, welcome to the Keltner Book Club. This might be the last meeting. Once the season starts, I probably won't be doing the book club. So, um, but this can be like a fun chat. In August? In August? Yeah, when does the season start? Yeah. yeah. Good point. You tell me. Yeah. So I am, I've been working at the ballpark and it, you know, here in Milwaukee. And um, so it was all dirt field. Have you, has anybody else been to the ballpark? It's all dirt field. Yeah. And um, I was there in December when they had it tore up for the uh, sale. So, yeah. Well, last week the, the sod came. So they just resodded the field, which I thought was, could make you hopeful, but I don't know. We'll see. But it's very dead there. There, I mean, there are employees working. The ticket, the ticket office is open. I don't know how many people are buying tickets. Because does anybody have tickets for the Brewers games? So no, I don't know. Yeah, and so I get calls about people who have bought tickets and they're not happy. So um, especially uh, spring training games. So, which is really sad because, you know, they only have that month of games and like Dennis, you probably know, I don't know if you know anybody who's involved in baseball there, but you know, they have to make all their money in that month. And Yeah. Uh, the city of uh, the, the Phoenix area pulls in $663 million of spring training. So oh, wow. last year with COVID, it was, we did, had, was hardly anything. You know, people are saying we support all these ballparks down here yet you guys cancel we don't get the game so yeah yeah so my, yeah, my son and i know the and brewers they can go see the brewers will open up there you can go in and watch their minor league camp uh starting on monday uh i live i, I live uh, probably half mile from the peoria uh border and so the ballpark in peoria is three miles away from seattle and uh san diego i don't know if they, i could go down there and see them I, I don't know if they're allowing people in but uh yeah my son and wife and two kids are uh, going to leave for for phoenix on sunday and they'll be down there for a week but no spring training but they're going for a week anyway yeah we still have yeah, sun and, and we don't have snow so it makes sense i heard the weather is beautiful there right it's, they were reporting on the radio from there, and um, and I have a cool. Cubs friend who went there anyway, visiting other Cubs friends who live there half the year. So they're they're still making the best of it. So I wonder how many people are still going to the area without getting, you know, they have some plane are, tickets. Some people golf and do all that sort of thing, and yeah. uh, and so there's part of that, but uh, yeah. It's been cooler. We've been we've been had like five days in the upper sixties, which is below wow. normal. You, know, you guys, that's perfect. For it and they wind down here, and we've been dropping into the forties at night. So yeah, yeah, that sounds nice. Yeah, yeah. we yeah. got a tenth of an inch of rain one day last week. No, yeah, last week got a tenth of an inch of rain. So we could send yeah. you some snow. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we got some they got some snow up in Flagstaff, but yeah. So, so here in Milwaukee, we're gonna get into the 50s mm. next week, which we're lucky to have in April. I mean, you know how it is. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's interesting. So you would think like MLB network could show minor league spring training games, but they probably won't do that because people will probably just be happy with that. And you know, but I don't know if, if any of you are embracing minor league ball this season a little more? I could well, see doing that. I just moved to Pewaukee from Oconomowoc and now Oconomowoc will have a team. And I, uh, I made a copy of their season schedule because I strongly suspect that those games will be played. So, um, you know, I'll probably buy tickets for those and maybe we can all go to a game, but uh, I'm not going to buy any tickets at County, well, County Stadium, like Miller Park, no, not even Miller Park anymore, but, but anyway. Uh, Remember that, uh, whatever that place is called stadium. American Family Field. So once I'm sure that games are being played, then I'll look into buying some tickets. Yeah. We'll be looking into doing a Mallards game in June. Mm -hmm. um, I, there's a couple of dates out there. I've got to, I, 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 
past the idea uh, with uh, past Steve Sch uh, Schmidt already, the owner of the mail, I had a conversation with him uh, just before we had Isla Borders on, just to see if he remembered. He he actually played in a game that she pitched, um, yeah. and uh, he remembered her. He, he didn't remember pitching the, the, the game, but I remember being there and seeing it. But he uh, he would love to have us, so he'll make arrangements for things. So uh, so we just have to start working on that. I'd be all in for that. I haven't been to a Madison game since they were the Black Wolf. Oof. So yeah, so okay. it's been a while. So just um, you know, on June 29th, I think it's um, a Wednesday night game for the Madison Mallards. They're having a 30th anniversary of a League of Their Own, the movie. Mm. So um, I'm not exactly sure what they're going to do. Sister Tony will be there because um, she lives in Madison. I don't know if they'll have any other players or anything, but that's one thing that's going on if anybody's interested. But yeah, it'll be interesting. Like they have the Doc Hounds this year. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And I'm going to go see the Brooklyn Cyclones in April. It's a uh, high A ball for the Mets. So all the affiliated minor league teams, as far as I know, those games are still going on. So, and I've never been to Coney Island all the times I've been to New York. So, um, so uh, it's baseball, it's baseball. Yeah. Is anybody going to go see college games or some people Woodchucks. go to college? What's that? We go see the Woodchucks in Wausau. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I might go see an Arizona State game. Mm -hmm. I bet that's pretty good ball down there. Yeah, yeah. 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 I know the softball is really good. Yeah. Okay, so we can start talking about the book. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to get Joseph Posnanski. Um, he's a prolific writer, an excellent writer. Um, so he, uh, I don't know if anybody's checked out his blog. It's excellent. He does a lot of other sports, you know, especially football. Um, so. Maybe we can start out talking about, I like uh, John Strobush suggested we talk about our favorite entry or favorite player. They could be two different things. So does anybody have, or their worst or something they didn't like at all? Does anybody <laughs> want to talk about that? Larry, you got- yeah, I'll jump in. All right. Well, first, I mean, this is a virtually impossible book to write, as we all know. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're just asking for controversy. That's part of the appeal, obviously, the discussion going. Um, I'm also doubtful that you can really legitimately compare players across a broad spectrum of time fairly. Uh, how do you compare Babe Ruth to Barry Bonds? I think that's very difficult to do. And so this is clearly a very subjective work. And uh, certainly, I don't know how many of you remember the Sabre 100 that came out in 99, a lot different than this one. Um, let me just, can I just ask a question before I talk about what I want to talk about? Does anyone else agree with this placement of Willie Mays as the greatest player? No, not at all. I mean, to sit, again, Everything's subjective, I grant you that. But how anybody can make a list of the greatest baseball players and not have Babe Ruth number one is beyond my comprehension. I agree. I mean, we all know he's not only the changed the game, fundamentally, the biggest sports hero, don't tell me about Michael Jordan, the biggest sports hero in American history is still Babe Ruth. Uh, Got to put it in the context of the time. Um, and, you know, how many games did Millie, Willie Mays win as a pitcher? I mean, to me, again, this is my opinion, but that's not what I want to talk about specifically. Yeah. Hey, hey Larry, real quick. Yeah. Poznanski uh, has been clear. I think I heard him on a podcast. It was, I think it was a Sabre podcast. I heard him on a podcast say this was his top 100 list. He's not saying that he is right. Of course. Uh, and, and so he, he, he's, he's mentioned that a number of times. This is yeah. his list. And that's how it's written. So from that standpoint, he wasn't etching it in stone. You know? No, of course. But, and even in his uh, introduction, he says that, as his mother would say, it took a lot of chutzpah yeah. to write such a book. Well, I know. So I, I, listen, I give him a 
a lot of credit for being able to put something like this together. Yeah, he, well, he, he got criticism because the Maggio's is ranked 56. That's well, what I want to talk about. And he said, well, what was what was the Maggio streak? 56 games. So yeah. he, he took Jackie Robinson tried to was play number 42. So, that was so he downplayed the order. So, yeah. So well, you, have to, you have to. Except, yeah, I understand that. But the title of the book is Baseball's Top 100, and he's ranking them. Mm -hmm. And anybody who's going to argue that Joe DiMaggio is the 56th greatest ball player, to me, that undermines the credibility of the book. Um, when Saber did their listings in 99, Joe DiMaggio was number six. Uh, he, sh he should have been number five because he wore number five. <laughs> I'm going to go by that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he said, you know, Joe DiMaggio is linked to 56. Sure. Does that make him the 56th best player out of 100? I'm you know, again, this is obviously I'm not totally objective. Not that Joe DiMaggio was my hero. You know, I hated Joe DiMaggio when I was a kid because I was a Red Sox fan. Ted Williams, not an Italian ball player. Ted Williams is my hero, still is. I hated DiMaggio, I hated Barra, all those guys, because they were the Yankees. They were the arch enemy. But I think in terms of uh, the intent of this book, if it is to rank in order the top 100 players, using the number 56 for the reason he does, I think is unacceptable. And why did he do it? Because he, he used all these tools where he could really legitimately rank them. Like he has a good grasp of analytics. He certainly sure. uses them. So why did, and then he just kind of blew it up. I agree yeah. with you. Mm -hmm. I think he did it to, to uh, generate this conversation. Exactly. I think that's why he put like Barry Bonds ahead of Hank Aaron. That little thing where, because he knows there's controversy in just comparing Barry Bonds with Henry Aaron, and then to put Barry Bonds just ahead of him. Yeah, he wanted, he wanted to shake things up a little. Yeah. In fact, regarding Barry Bonds, uh, in the book, in the chapter on Bonds, he said that uh, Bonds became the greatest baseball player who ever lived. And then he rated them, he ranked them number three. Yeah. So the uh, author would have been here, I would have asked him about that. And, you know, as far as uh, making controversy, well, you know, um, I think putting uh, Joe, Joe DiMaggio at 56, just way too much controversy, about 15 or 17 or something like that. That would be controversy, but 56, that's just wild. Would it, would it have helped had he said somewhere in here, I have him, fit, he didn't explain why he's 56 very well, for one. He did that in, in the podcast I heard. Would it help if he said, I have him here to honor the streak? I would have, if in the top 100, he would have been, it would have been better if he at least said, I would have had him ranked here. Would that have, would that have alleviated a little of that, Larry? <laughs> Well, it still would be contradictory. I mean, to that, I would have ranked him number 10. Okay. But because he had a 56, well, I mean, why isn't Barry Bonds 73? He had 73 uh, home runs in one season. I agree, with, I agree with Larry. It's almost like he wanted to, uh, it, the author wanted to be taken symbolically and literally at the same time. You, if he can't, I mean, you can't do that because, because the reader's brains are going, now, which is it? It's a great book, but I think it's just, I think it's because, what makes it great is because you can't, you can't really figure the guy out. <laughs> he tries to do both at the same time. It doesn't, uh, the, rate, the rating system may not work. I mean, uh, Oscar Charleston and Thor, when he, when he did that one, he actually wrote, come on, I dare you to challenge me, Oscar Charleston and Thor. And he wanted, he wanted people to say, who the hell is Oscar Charleston? And I guarantee that's what some people were saying. I know it's, it's all based on selling books uh, <laughs> with, with, uh, with, with debate with him. And, he, that's what he did in the Atlantic, and that's what he's doing here. And he's doing a good, doing a good job, doing a good job of it. So I don't know that 
makes I don't know if that makes uh I don't know if that makes uh makes it better or worse, but I think for us wanting a for us wanting, wanting a critical evaluation, we're not, we're not, we're not getting it. We're, we're not getting Bill James here, unfortunately. I wish it would have trended more toward that. Well, you get beyond the idea that it's supposed to be a countdown book. It, just reading the stories, they're they're incredibly well written. So, I think that's all that's important. And you kind of ignore the order. I don't know. Well, if you ignore the order, then the title of the book shouldn't be the top one hundred. Well, they're probably the top one hundred, but you could rearrange them. Well, it's the top one hundred baseball players, not necessarily. Top the ranking. He's not calling the top 100 baseball players by rank. The baseball exactly. 100. So he's he saying the, the, the top 100. The baseball 100. That's his. That's his. What he's trying to sell it as. He doesn't say top 100. Yeah. The baseball. Yeah, 100. he just chose 100 players. Yeah. Yeah. All right. But he ranks, ranks, them, ask he him. ranks them in or his order. You can't have it both ways. Mm -hmm. If you want, you, you could have done it alphabetically chronologically if it's just you know the greatest 100 yeah. players without making this guy's number one this guy's 56 but he chose to write the book that way and to me he undercuts that in a few instances at least mm -hmm. yeah i agree and if he was here i was going to ask him who really missed the cut who was number 101 to 105 for example i i, been, I, I know i know to your point dave he said uh, Turkey's Turns is very missed. He put 101. <laughs> I've heard that too. Yeah. Right. He, he did mention that. Yeah. And, and Larry, I, uh, I share your liking of uh, Ted Williams. He's one of my favorites too. I've read a couple of books on him and a lot of articles. And uh, I found that after he retired, he was quite gracious. Uh, and he appeared with Joe DiMaggio, where Joe DiMaggio in William's presence was um, was introduced as the greatest player of all time at, at that point. And Williams just accepted that and went out and took a bow along with Joe DiMaggio. Well, no, Williams said that Joe DiMaggio was the greatest player he ever saw. And to me, you can't dismiss, I mean, obviously statistics are important. But when someone like Ted Williams, they were not good friends. I mean, they were cordial, but they were never close friends. So for Ted Williams, who wanted to be remembered as the greatest hitter of all time, to say that Joe DiMaggio was the greatest ball player he ever saw, you can't discard that, in my mind. Mm -hmm. I mean, the eye test is pretty important at that level. Um, I want to mention something about a player that I always had a high regard for, and he got the worst treatment in this book of anybody. Um, when I was young, back in the 50s, Rogers Hornsby was wow. named the, the best right-handed hitter of all time Yes, at, at that time. And, you know, this guy, the author of this book goes on for maybe three pages uh, telling about how, what a bad guy he was. Yeah. And I read a book on, uh, on Rogers Hornsby, and it didn't make him out to be nearly as bad as he appears in this book. I'm not saying he's he's a nice guy. I mean, some of my favorite ball players, Ted Williams included, really had their rough sides. But um, but still, you know, he he came off much better in the book that I read than on these three pages. He he, he almost indicated that Hornsby was uh, worse than Cobb, yeah. which uh, uh, when I read that, I thought, wow. And and Cobb, he, he I thought the chapter on Cobb covered it well. But I'm not sure he convinced me that Hornsby was worse than Cobb. But I, when I saw that, I thought that was a big surprise. Yeah, me too. Because Cobb came out number 17, and it doesn't seem like he'd be that uh, rated there based on his on-field accomplishments. Yep. Well, I so found what do you think all of those... Go ahead. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I was, I was just wondering if how people thought of his ranking of uh, Negro League players, because a lot of the information we have is anecdotal and not mm -hmm. statistical. So, but at least he included them, I think. But, you know, then he kind of contributed, like he said, Satchel Page might have been the best pitcher, but 
he list he listed uh, Walter Johnson ahead of Satchel Page, yeah. which isn't so bad, but you know, I don't know. I think Satchel Page had an incredible talk about Babe Ruth's influence on the game. You know, Satchel Page. You know, he is basically you know a big free agent long before that was a thing in the major leagues, and um, yeah, just in you know all just the time, you know, the vastness of his career. But anyway. Well, and white folks went to see Satchel Page pitch in Negro League games, so he absolutely you know, actually he was helped. such a drawing card. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and also played on an integrated team. He played on in, um, an integrated team in North Dakota, I think, well before Jackie Robinson. Bismarck, North, North Dakota. Was it Bismarck? Yes. Yeah, that's why I thought Bismarck. The nice thing about this book is. You can pick it up and open it up anywhere, and start reading, and it's immediately interesting. I thought it was kind of almost nice that he didn't list the top hundred in order in the front who's ranked where. And in doing so, you know, then I liked it for that reason. I guess that was kind of my point where you, you, you know, that it, I, I can see, I, like Larry, I totally understand what you're saying and I agree with you. But then as you're reading the book, like I started, I actually started with number one, Willie Mays, and went backwards. And I've never read a book like that. I was just telling Dennis, mm -hmm. I don't know, that's just, I just, you're not sure. that's what drew my interest were the top players sure. more. And then, um, but then, you know, the order, and then I'm skipping around. So, the order doesn't really matter to me once I dig in, but yeah, as a countdown book, I don't agree with the order. I don't know if that makes sense, but sure. that's where I'm at. And, and going along your line or Dave's line, I, 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 I'd see the next next player and say, well, we, we've read so much about Mickey Mantle. What can he possibly tell me about Mickey Mantle? And he'd make it interesting. I thought he always seemed to have something interesting to talk about a player, no matter how well we knew him. And that in itself uh, kept me interested. I have to read the next player. If for no other reason, say, what's he going to say about this guy? So he did. I thought he did a good job of, of creating interest with each player. And even these stories that we've heard before, I like to hear them again, just like bedtime stories. And I've heard about Ken Williams hitting 406 on the last day of the season and him hitting a home run, his last that bad. But still, if someone wants to tell me that story, I'll listen again. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So the question I asked Mary before everybody was on, and a couple of you guys have written books, so you've done this. Who's ever seen a white cover on a book? <laughs> I don't recall in my life a white cover on a book. You know, I, I'm real fussy about my books. They always look pristine. I try, how do I keep from getting fingerprints all over this thing? But who have, I've never seen a white cover on a book before. Is anybody I wish else? I were artistic. I would like color all over this oh, if yeah. I had any talent. Yeah. <laughs> well, you'll have to cover on, Dave. Yeah, no, I, I always ruin those when I do that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I checked it out from the library. I wait to have my wife buy it for my birthday. Um, while we're, we were talking about Ty Cobb and, uh, and to make the, the it, to make the point that we learn something new about these guys in every every chapter, practically. But I didn't know, and I was curious to know if any of you guys, or you folks, were aware of how thoughtful Cobb appears to have been. Um, his last at bat in that that uh, old timers game, when he told the catcher to step back, <laughs> step back. A, um, a step so that because he was he says I'm old and I'm good I can't hold the bat and all he was doing was setting him up so he could bunt try to bunt safely yeah. but I, I wasn't aware that he was quite as thoughtful as what he was made out to be and I was curious to know if any of you others had the same reaction no I thought this is I I thought I'm not sure I ever thought that deep on that but my initial thought was 
he'll do anything to win. So I'm going to, you know, so his thoughtfulness was, how do I get the advantage? How do I win? Here's why I get the advantage. So he, he was always thinking how he could get an advantage. And so that just seemed to fit into that. Okay. Yeah. But I thought that was very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and he knew the guy. <laughs> he knew the catcher. <laughs> and this was a game for fun. He was, he was playing for blood. What the hell? Well, what about favorite? Like, I thought his entry on Stan Musial was wonderful. I mean, that's just one that I really thought a lot of. I thought the one on Phil Negro was very good. I haven't read that one yet. It's good. You'll like it. Why did you like it? I, I think it, um, I think it, it captured Necro very well. I mean, obviously that's what he's trying to do with every character here, but mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, not that I know him very well, but I, I have met Necro and, um, and it just, it seems to, he, he really got his personality into the, the story. There's certain ones that I thought were almost contrived. I thought that of the Willie Mays chapter it just seemed like he was trying too hard to be artistic and literary and and so forth. And uh, I don't know, I, I don't think that worked as well as most of his have. Um, the one on Eddie Matthews, I mean, this is uh, someone that I knew and, um, and I thought that there was so much emphasis on the fact that it took him a long time to get into the Hall of Fame. I mean, that's, I guess that's worth a paragraph, but I don't know if it's worth two pages. Um, he asked, how can, how can only 32% of the voters vote for Matthews in the first year? Well, it's a good question. And he does answer the question, but it takes forever to do it. Um, so, I, I mean, you, you can say that about every chapter. There, there are things that you like better than others. Overall, I thought it was terrific. I, it's a great book. There's a and, there's a wide variety of um, of approaches that he takes. He he tries not to be uh, too much of a pattern where everyone is the, the same. So so and so did this, and then he was in the minors, and then all, and he he avoids that. I think there might be too great a reliance on statistics. I mean, after a while, you just start swimming in numbers. But I guess that's what we find appealing about baseball. So uh, it needs to be included. And Bob, I guess if anyone knows anything about Eddie Matthews, you are the one, you know, having written like that. But um, the book that we're talking about right now uh, shows how many uh, fabulous players have played this game. You know, if Tony Gwynn is number 95, you know, that just shows that there are so many greats in here. He only made 95. And, and uh, well, because I don't have any anywhere farther to go with that, but uh, uh, something you said, Larry, about ranking the players. Uh, I've always had an easier time comparing non pitchers, you know, when I consider the area in which they played and, and the, the park in which they played and the team they played on and so forth. I, I could, you know, put numbers, find numbers to those and uh, compare them against each other, but I've always had a hard time comparing pitchers to the, the hitters, you know, uh, for example, he has George Brett, 35, Cy Young, 34, Jimmy Fox, 33. Now, you know, how to put a picture in the midst of that is kind of beyond me. I don't have a good evaluation system. Do you? How, Larry, how, how do you uh, evaluate pitchers against hitters? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. You really, uh -huh. You're Comparing apples and oranges, yeah. 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 I think I have the same sense. It's very difficult. Again, the other point is that how do you compare somebody from the early decades of the 20th century to ball players today? I think most analysts would say generally ball players today are much better than ball players were 80 years ago, 40 years ago. I think that's probably true. But it's, that's why I think it's so difficult to make these comparisons over time 
as well as between pitchers and hitters. Um, and I, 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 I don't know how you resolve that issue. Um, I, I, I think it's virtually impossible. You know, I just try to see how they rank, see how they compare with the players at their time. For yes. example, in, in 1920, Babe Ruth had 54 home runs. And the second place was Sisler with 19. You know, so he was obviously head and shoulders above everyone else. And I give him a lot of credit for that. Yeah, I think you're right. I think uh, it, it's fair to say how how much better is this player than other players of his era? And that's fair. But to compare, you know, people, I suppose the, the fans who are not quite as into statistics or history for that matter, the image they have in their minds of Babe Ruth is the fat old guy. I mean, that seems to be the picture you get of Babe Ruth more than any other. Not the 19 year old guy who was a physical phenom and yep. one of the best outfielders, what a great arm as a pitcher and as an outfielder. Um, you know, they think of this old guy who couldn't run and how, how good could he have been? So it's, it's really not fair in that regard. And not only not fair, but I think not possible to make a comparison over a long span of time. Yep, and then the pictures, the, the pictures we have of Babe Ruth at the end of his career are of an old fatter guy, you know, not, not the pictures from 1915 and 1914 and so forth. Well, we got that plus, then those old movies are kind of sped up a little bit and it makes it look extra goofy. Well, they, they think, what would Babe Ruth do today? How would he hate, you know, he didn't face black pictures, uh, they didn't play night, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Well, if Babe Ruth had been born at the same time that Barry Bonds was born, he wouldn't have been the Babe Ruth that we think of as the old man. In other words, he would have been a product of his time. Mm -hmm. And it's, again, it's, I think, very difficult to make those comparisons fairly. Uh, another comparison is, uh, I've always thought it was a real close call between the greatness of Gehrig and Fox, uh, but it doesn't come across that way in this book. Uh, how do you feel about the comparison between those two, Larry? Well, I don't think I know enough to. Okay. You know, I think with back when you the Sabre rankings back there in 99, I think Gehrig was, uh, let me take a look here. Yeah, Gehrig was number two to Babe Ruth. <laughs> That's, I mean, well, again, here's a question. Who would we put more faith in the opinions of this one very talented writer and very knowledgeable writer in terms of ranking players as opposed to that Sabre poll that was taken in 99, where I don't know how many, but I'm sure hundreds of people, most of whom were fairly knowledgeable if they're Sabre members, I mean, which one of those lists do you think has more credibility? Oh, the Sabre one for me. Really? But the other issue is even back in 99, some of the Sabre metrics and the numbers and things that we have now, uh, the more advanced Sabre metrics change some of the numbers and how you look at people. So you, and some of the things he was looking at was some of those numbers that weren't out there at that time. Uh, and so there's some of that. Uh -huh. uh, from a comparison standpoint. So there, there are, we do know these players statistically better, um, yeah. you know, but, uh, you know, and, and uh, Garrick and, you know, uh, how, what, what benefit did he have having Babe Ruth batting ahead of him, you know, and uh, or disadvantages. And, and, and you, it just, there's no way of statistically looking at that. Uh, for years, we just said those two are one and two, and now there's other, you know, people coming in there. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, I, I struggled greatly with Barry Bonds just because of, uh, you know, Barry Bonds would have probably been a Hall of Famer had he not done the droids. Uh, he would have probably still been in, but all that changed every perspective on him, all the intentional walks, every, all these things that were set, 
he put every, he, everything was just uh, askew because of his steroid use. And so ranking him up there, um, that just kind of destroys the, uh, I didn't like that in the list. Uh, I, I, I cared less about the list, but I was reading it. Uh, I enjoyed reading the players were in there. Uh, I enjoyed the story, so that helped a lot. But Barry Bonds kind of disturbed me. Uh, Tony Gwynn, you mentioned earlier, up there at 95. I thought, 95? That's it for Tony Gwynn? I thought he should have been. I, I don't know where he should have been up, but I thought he was further to the middle than he would have been to the end of the top 100. So, yeah. Regarding Barry Bonds, uh, I think there's something beyond just the drugs. And I think it's his personality, which... Yes according to nearly everybody who dealt with him, uh, was just ridiculous. I mean, he wasn't just unfriendly. He was uh, nasty in almost every uh, contact with a writer. Um, but those of us who went to the Sabre Convention and saw Barry Bonds, where was that? Was that in uh, Miami? Dennis yeah, Hamilton. it was in Miami. He came out as a batting coach. Right, yes. or he's working for the team. Yeah. yeah. Well, he was he was absolutely charming. Yeah. He was exactly what what this author says he was. He when he wanted to be, he was charming. He was self deprecating. He was uh, a nice, admirable person. Knowledgeable. If he had that, if he had that kind of personality, and the writers didn't dislike him, but actually liked the guy. And then you add that to his numbers, um, I think he would be in. Just my own theory. One other thing I want to mention, because I think it's a great line. Um, this gets back to Eddie Matthews' chapter, but how in the heck was Pi Trainer selected over Eddie Matthews? I think that's a great point. Um, mm -hmm. I was wondering about that. Pi Trainer? But <laughs> I don't know. I never saw him play, so... From what I've heard, uh, back when he was playing, he wasn't held in such high regard. But later on, you know, maybe 10 years or more later, then people were talking about him as being the greatest third baseman at one time. As a homer, I'd have to ask, how did Pi, Pi Trainer get in and Kenny Keltner didn't? Sorry, I'm just, you know, the Keltner chapter. I have to defend our, <laughs> our namesake's honor. So. Sure. so there are a lot of Hall of Famers that didn't make this book. I mean, that's just... The way it is. And then you have fringe people who just miss the Hall of Fame. So yeah, it's a tough book. It's it's tough to do. Um, but yeah, I, I'm with Dennis. I I kind of had to ignore ignore it as a countdown book. I'm sure that Saber list is a lot more valid than than this list as a countdown book. So then you just have to enjoy the stories. Um, but yeah, Eddie, Eddie Matthews, you know, there, there were, there, there was always kind of a bias against third basemen. Like they're, they're very, they're, is, are, is third base like totally underrepresented in the Hall of Fame to begin with? And then there were a couple of third basemen that the writers didn't per particularly like, Ron Sano and, and maybe Eddie Matthews to a certain extent, some writers. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? You know, I can understand how somebody trying to do their job and interview a person would object to the way Eddie responded to things, but he, he just wasn't comfortable in that environment. He didn't like one-on-one -on -one interviews, especially. And there were a number of ball players back in that era who, what was Yogi Berra four votes also? I'm trying to think, you know, some of these guys, it took two, three, four votes to get in. They, you know, now we think are unanimous. And they weren't getting in. Very few people went in on the first vote, not unanimous, first vote. Very, very few. Very few. Yeah. yeah. In that post-World War II, it seemed that for the first four, five, six, seven, eight years, there were years they didn't have anyone go in. They, they, they just, the, the voters had this feeling that to, to go into the Hall of Fame, uh, your, your middle name had to be God. Uh, you know, and so they were very, 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 very uh, stingy with their votes. So... So Some people would argue how it's gone too far the other way. Some are. Yeah. And Mary, regarding third baseman, I think around the time of Babe Ruth and so forth, third base was more of a defensive position. And so people didn't have body numbers to put up. And not many third basemen got in back then. 
I think that's it's true. You always think of it as a power position. Yeah, yeah. yeah wow. You know, Bob, on your lines of what you're saying about Barry Bonds not being likable, uh, I thought the chapter on Clemens, I didn't realize how less than friendly, how, how ordinary of a person he was. And is that hurting? Did that hurt his vote also? Because he came across pretty, pretty negative. Yes, he did. The, um, who was the visiting clubhouse manager for many years with the Brewers that did the, actually ended up writing a book? Jim Kaczynski? Yeah. He told me a story once about Clemens, who was in the locker room after a game. He was on the phone talking to his son in Texas, who was a high school football player. And he said he was screaming at his son on the phone because he hadn't played well in the previous football game. And that was his picture of Roger Clemens. Not at all, not at all pretty. And again, when, when Roger Clemens was with the Red Sox, I thought he was great. Yeah. Then he went to the Yankees. And this is the same Clements who felt bad that he didn't have a father show up to his games. And he's doing that to his own son. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Does someone else have a favorite player that they want to bring up? My favorite player all time is Henry Aaron, but my favorite entry was Stan Musial. So what are you? Stan Musial, okay. when after I read his, I, I said, okay, I don't want to read another one. This one was really good. I don't want to move on. I just, I wanted to close the book on it. And it was late at night anyhow, so I should be getting to bed. But I wanted to close the book and end on that because it was. So, it, yeah. But he's just, that's that Stan the man. He was that type of person. Yeah. I was the kind surprised of person to he see was. him rank as high as he was. And very pleased to see that he did put them that high. Yeah. See, I think he's kind of overlooked a little bit now. Yep. Uh, yeah, so how daughter, much... Oh, excuse me. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Daughter, how much does bias play in, in the list? You know, but I'm sorry. Go ahead, Molly. My daughter-in-law works for the St. Louis Cardinals. Uh, in, in, she's, a, she's a special events manager. But she works in the office with with the Cardinal staff, and before Stan Musial died, I think you find you may find it a, um, consistent with what we read that th when he would come up uh, regularly, every couple of weeks or so, he'd come up to visit the staff, and it was her her words were it was it was like it was almost like God was walking in the room. Mm. They you know they just respected him that much. Wally, we didn't know that you had a daughter working for the Cardinals. We may have to uh, consider your Sabre membership with Ken Keltner chapter. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> you're a really good member. I guess we'll, you're, you're safe right now. But yeah, my son would tell me to say that well, he's the Cardinals. So. Yeah. Their, uh, their neighbor, uh, they live down in Illinois, southern Illinois. Their neighbor is um, Ben Fredrickson, who's a sports writer for uh, St. Louis Post dispatch, and so <laughs> gets a, you get a little bit of insight once in a while into what St. Louis baseball looks like. Yeah. They're good they fans. Do. They're knowledgeable. They're oh yeah, they're they're but, they're crazy. <laughs> yeah. So they, would would you recommend this book to others? If yes. They're in good physical condition, they could carry it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is like carrying around the baseball encyclopedia. <laughs> I yeah. was uh, I was holding off until it came out in soft cover, so it'd be lighter. Mm -hmm. And Linda watched uh, CBS this morning, and uh, what, what's his name said met, recommended this book, and so she bought it on his recommendation. Even though anything about the book, and just he said it's a good book, buy it. So she bought it for me for Christmas. So so I had to lug this heavy piece around with me. So yeah. <laughs> I would recommend it. It's uh, uh, it, it's just because of the quality of the writing and the baseball players in general he's writing about was very very good. You know the rankings are an issue, but uh, I, I enjoyed the stories. The and I agree with Bob. Bob. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mary. Why well, I agreed? I agreed with what you said before. He wasn't formulaic. You know, it could have fallen into a yeah. 
you know, kind of a stodgy way of, you know, covering each player, but um, yeah, he, he approached it from different angles. So I'm, what were you going to say, Bob? I was just going to say, I think he, he successfully combines um, something new and something old with, with all the guys, every one of them. Um, as a baseball fan, obviously, you know a lot of this stuff. There's something familiar in every single chapter. But at the same time, you learn something, not just one or two things, but obviously hundreds, but you learn something ab about the person in every chapter. Um, that's not easy to do. So you want to you want to be, uh, well, somewhat balanced uh, between those two extremities. And uh, I thought he really did that well. I agree. Yeah. Well, I, say, I think it's certainly worthwhile because it's going to remind people of a lot of players that they maybe have forgotten about or didn't know that they were as great as they were or whatever. I mean, it brings a lot of material together, which I think is fascinating reading for baseball fans. Mm -hmm. That's as long a great as you point. approach it with the right attitude that you know, it is what it is and any book of this kind would be flawed or argumentative. That's part of the genre. It's the nature of baseball. We always yeah, have yeah. every, 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 how many discussions can we have on how many different plays in a single ball game and we're, and everybody's right. <laughs> and they never change my <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I agree he can dwell on a point like um was it Nap Lajaway? I kind of got I would I just wasn't that interested in the minutiae of how he was trying to win the batting title. But I don't know, maybe some people get into that. Well, I think there's something for everybody. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I enjoy, I always mention, I, well, we got some very good authors on here. So I enjoy your writing. And I don't think I have a writing style yet. I'm, one of these days, I'll figure out what, how to write and not be an accounting type. But I just enjoyed his writing style. Maybe how he's writing the book, it's not biographical in its day. So he could put comments in and do some of that. But so he made it entertaining and easy to read in many ways. And I, I, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed that with Bill James too. With his, I thought he had good humor and sarcasm in his writings that yeah. made me like to read it. For sure. I can't think of an example now, but um, I was struck by the fact that he could um, take a, any one of these players and he could digress from his subject yeah. just briefly to bring in something that was interesting, but yeah. technically not related to the, the ball player. Um, it could be two or three pages of that sidetrack. <laughs> yeah. But it, he was very interesting in doing it. it mm -hmm. I thought it came across well. Yeah. It's a style that's kind of uniquely engaging. And, and uh, I think is a, it's a, a pattern or a formula that, that uh, anybody that interested in writing about personalities in sport could pick up some, some tips there. Yeah. Yeah, I like how he kind of plays with us. Like he does, he does this in his blog a lot and in this book a lot where he, he's like, well, you know, he describes something and he's like, well, I'll get to that, and, yeah. you know. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, well, why don't you just, <laughs> why don't you just talk about it? But yeah, he messes with us a little bit. And some of his little asterisk asides were kind of fun too. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. I was surprised of all the stuff I didn't know about Eddie Collins. I've never really looked into his career very much, but. Um, I thought that was a really fascinating chapter, beginning to end. It was, it was all these things that, see, Eddie Collins did that. Yeah. Like Larry said, you, you, it's nice to get this little spotlight on these, especially older players. You know, mm -hmm. I, I might not want to read a whole book on Eddie Collins, but 
It was really interesting to read the chapter. Yeah. But so, yeah. And I also, there were some of the Negro League players in there that so many people don't know anything about. So getting some of them in there was also uh, very interesting to, to, to understand what, what their game was. So. And sometimes with the passage of time, we, we remember things differently than they may have been. And uh, just let me tell you uh, this about a player who's not in the book, uh, Andre Dawson, when he was, uh, when he, well, he wanted to play for the Cubs real badly. And uh, at that time, it seemed to me that he wanted to play for the Cubs because that was a good park for him to play in. And uh, he, he we lost you, Dave, or at least you know, I did. It came time to for the Hall of Fame and for other actors. And uh, can, oh, can you hear me now? It's garbled. Kind of breaking up. Okay. You're well, a little broken up. Yeah. I got a message on here saying that that was happening. Mm. Oh, I'll shut up for now. No, we're going to no. hear you now. Oh, it's okay. No. Okay. Uh, anyway, I got the impression that uh, Andre Dawson wanted to play for the Cubs because that would be a nice park for him to play in to pile up statistics for, for his evaluation later on. And uh, that brings me to Larry Walker, who's in this book at number 97. I got the same impression about him. He, want, he wanted to be traded to Colorado uh, for... I thought much the same reason, because then offensively, he looked really good in Colorado. Uh, I don't know if any of you thought so, or, you know, am I, am I somewhat wrong or entirely wrong on this? About Larry Walker? I, I recall the... his, uh, his statistics away from the park uh, were quite different than his statistics in Colorado, which is one of the reasons that some people thought he was a questionable selection for the Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. Another good chapter, I think, is the one on Grover Cleveland Alexander. Mm -hmm. uh, if you remember, he talks quite a bit here about uh, the movie, the, the winning team. And, I just and how terrible it was. It was <laughs> an awful, <laughs> awful film. <laughs> I'm hoping that I've never seen that. And then even more so, the, the Babe Ruth story, you know, with William Bendix. And <laughs> that was bad, too. <laughs> there are others of Ruth, too, of course, but William Bendix, I'll never forget <laughs> trying to imagine him being an athlete. But <laughs> <laughs> it Wasn't he a right-handed batter, and they turned him around like they did... Um... Um, Gary Cooper? And... Gary Cooper, yeah, they turned yeah. him... They, uh, yeah. Well, I don't, they didn't, they didn't. Um, if you read an article that uh, Tom Sheber from the Hall of Fame wrote about the film, he proves that they did not do that. Oh. Really? Yeah. Good story. Oh, huh. well, I was misinformed. Yeah. <laughs> One thing about that uh, film about Grover Cleveland Alexander, they never mentioned the fact that he was an epileptic. They passed him off as a, an alcoholic, but behind all of that was his epilepsy. And they, at that time, you just wouldn't mention that in a film because it was so highly stigmatized. Same, same with Tony Lazzari. The public was never informed and never knew that Lazzari was an epileptic because it was such a terrible disease to have. They thought you were somehow either physically or mentally disabled and so on. They used to put epileptics in the asylum. That's how bad it was. Even diabetics. Huh? Diabetics faced that same. Yeah. Um, yeah, Ron uh, Santo. Ron Santo. Hit, hit it. Santo. Yeah. Yes. When we were discussing your um, uh, Tommy Lazari, a uh, Tony Lazari book, uh, we, we were talking about that. Yeah, it's really too bad that they couldn't um, shine a light on what these players had to go through. Well, yeah, because if they were playing today, uh, oh my gosh, it would be role models, you know, exactly. inspirational stories of what you can accomplish in spite of this affliction. And in that Absolutely. time, you had to keep it under wraps. 
Yeah. yeah. What a shame. Because yeah. you never cease. The doctor that I interviewed here at the medical college about epilepsy said, you know, you never see uh, famous people, celebrities, raising funds publicly for epilepsy. They'll do it about a lot of other cancer, even mental illness now, yeah. but never epilepsy. Yeah, you're right. I remember, growing, I remember growing up, my mother called it the fits. So there was such yeah. a negative, the, 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 the wording yes. and everything was so negative that, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the good old days, yeah. <laughs> so anything else about the book or, or you wanna just bitch about the lockout? <laughs> <laughs> Are you tired of that? Before I lose tired the, of it, a pox <laughs> on both their houses. <laughs> Before I lose lose the thought, to, um, we're talking about the style that um, that the author uses in this, but in this di these digressions of sorts, and I and I'm finding myself picking picking back in my brain. Um, if you read short stories very much. I think that there's a name for that, that style. And it goes back, we just recently at another book club I belong to read, we're reading short stories and one of them is by James, or several are by James Joyce. And he seems to have done exactly the same thing. And I, I'm struggling to remember what they call that style. I think, I think that, and Joyce mastered it. And I think he, it's called something like internal, internal narrative or internal dialogue, but I'm not sure about me. What, for whatever per, whatever it is, I just remembered that this style was something that was he was perfecting, and that was back in the twenties or so, I guess. So, you know, anyway, I think uh, Poznanski may may be very conscious of what what that style is, and he just he just uses it very well. That's really interesting. Yeah, I, I'd love to hear if he was influenced by. Yeah. You know, who are his influences? You know, probably sports writers, but other writers as well. Yeah. Well, like for any of you who write, do you have, who are your influences, if any? Bob Beagie. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was an interesting question. I don't know. Uh, probably a conglomeration of things. I, I don't know. Suppose, yeah. Yeah. Wally, if I heard you right, you read something that doesn't have a third baseman in it. I'm not sure how I can read those kinds of books. Uh, <laughs> I may read a non-baseball book once a year. <laughs> it's like, wow, James Joyce. Oh, that that's literature. Yeah, yeah that's, that's literature, right? <laughs> I know I try. I'm pretty single-minded, but I, I try to read something non-baseball related. I just keep getting more and more of those books. So I look at the pile thinking, I better start reading through some of those. And then, you know. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, we're talking about books. We've got a member uh, who lives in Madison who's got a book coming out shortly on uh, Dave Bancroft, the, sh the old uh, shortstop. Um, he just sent me, he sent me a PDF copy of it. I haven't opened it up yet to look at it, uh, uh, but we may be having a meeting with him uh, to talk about that book. I'm not sure if that's a book club read or for the, just to talk about it from the general membership, just, uh, but uh, so he, he just sent me an email on that. So we have another Keltner member who's uh, written a book. So it's good to see. Oh, well, that's great. Yeah. 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 What's his name? I can't It'd be a nice way to meet him and yeah. Yeah. He's from Madison. I'm not sure I know what his, remember what his name is. Because uh, there probably won't be baseball till May. I mean, that's the rumor that the owners, you know, April is just debt to them and they're happy to just not have games played until May. So they'll just, you know, play around with the players union for a while. And so, uh, yeah. So it'd be nice to have a meeting maybe in April before the season starts. 
but yeah it, this kind of reminds me of 2020 where it's just like endless winter like like yeah. i can't believe it's march already because i should be watching spring training and planning to go to baseball games and yeah, yeah. since i bought a condo down here i have not attended a spring training game we bought it in 2019 mm -hmm. uh, after spring training uh, came down that fall, left before, really, we, we were back in Wisconsin before February because my mother-in-law got sick, so, and then COVID hit, hit nothing last year. So this, I, you know, I used to go to spring training games because we were snowbirds all the time, but since I've owned a place down here, I've not been to a spring training game, went to Arizona Fall League. So, yeah, I was looking forward to spring training this year and going to some games. Yeah. Yeah, it's too bad. Yeah. Is anyone going to see less baseball games? Obviously, we're seeing less because we're losing part of the season, or like Bob said, August. But uh, but is anyone going to go to less games this year? Uh, upset about uh, all of this? Well, well, I'm a Cubs fan, so I was already going to. I was already giving up on the Cubs anyway. At least for what, like I, I tell people, I'm a non-practicing Cubs fan right now, and so <laughs> you know, at least for now, um, but. Yeah, so already, and I'll embrace minor league ball a little more. I'll go to the Milwaukee Milkmen, mm -hmm. Brooklyn Cyclones. St. Paul Saints are great. Has anybody been to a Saints game? They've, oh, yeah. and they have a great little museum at the ballpark. It's really excellent. Yeah, they're now AAA. Yeah, exactly. Twins affiliate. Yeah, very cool. I'm hoping to, I wanted to go to the Negro League Museum in May. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've never been to Kansas City, so I wanted to get to the museum and get a ball game in. And I don't know if that's going to happen. I haven't decided so, yet on how, uh, at, uh, I haven't decided on attending games at, um, at the first stadium yet, but I feel bad for baseball fans. See, Two years ago, remember, we had that 60-game season, and then COVID broke up things last year, and now things aren't starting this year. So um, my worry is that a lot of people will just, uh, a lot of people then who didn't attend baseball games would just think, well, gee, we found other things to do, and that was okay. And they, they might attend fewer games. And it's especially bad, I think, for the future fans now who aren't in the habit of going to the games. I worry about that. Gotta get the the baseball couldn't have picked the worst time to do what they're doing right mm -hmm. now, given the circumstances you just described. And people were just getting back into baseball by the end of last season. And now they're going to turn the clock back. I, I don't want to get into this. It's going to make me give me a headache. So I, I won't pursue it any further. It's just very sad. In the car today, I, I drive in, I uh, play softball at least two days a week down here and, and uh, went to a practice today, which was a mistake. But uh, um, uh, listen to MLB radio driving back, and these, these guys are also positive how things are going to happen today. And I thought, didn't we hear that last week? You know, it's. Uh, but, uh, they made any progress at all? I think the some the owners have moved up on the um, the luxury tax limits. I think they've 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 gone to a higher amount that goes like from two thirty to two fifty something in that range. So they're moving in the direction, um, but all of a sudden the uh, Latin American or no the foreign whatever they call it, the foreign draft or whatever the draft international draft international yeah. draft. Thank you for the big word. The international draft uh, is an item they're discussing. Awesome, that's been thrown into the into this. It's like you know, the, the, the owners seem to be coming, and then also at the last minute they throw something in, thinking, okay, they're going to accept this, so we can get this other thing thrown in. So all of a sudden, this international draft thing has been thrown at them. So, so who knows? I hope you're wrong about August, Bob, but I'm not voting against you. Well, we'll see. Yeah, I don't know. I hope not, but. How much patience do you think the the typical or average baseball fan has for for this uh, for these delays? You, you know, at some point, I, I guess what we're what we're 
articulating is the concern that a lot of fans will just walk away and do something else. But how how much how much patience do you think typical fans have? You think I mean, is it an April? Is it a May or a June or, or is it in August? Or is it just forget it after after if we skip the season? Is is baseball done? I feel the owners look at April's a lost month for us. We always have poor attendance. There's weather issues. There's, there, it, there's a lot going on. And Ken Rosenthal came out showing that most of their local TV contracts, if they don't own it, like the Yankees own their, their network, um, that if they miss less than 25 games, they earn their full contract. So they, so, so are they willing to lose April because fans are not following that much, knowing that when the weather turns better, when they can show up to ball games. So are fans being cheated that much? So the average fan maybe, or the casual fan, maybe, you know, maybe the fans who are a little more into the game are already going to be missing it because, you know, they're looking forward to opening day and they're looking forward to following the Brewers on the radio. I mean, there's a lot of fans who, who are good fans who, you know, do that year round. And are, are they still going to come back at the same level? People forget stuff that stuff like that. And then they, they've always come back. I mean, this is not new. Well, somebody that was a Green Bay Packer fan three days ago and what they thought about their quarterback, <laughs> and how it's all different. People want to see good athletic events and and they're willing to put up with almost anything. Bob Beagie, I believe that when the Braves left town, you kind of boycotted the Brewers for a while. How many years did that take? 20. <laughs> I used to be very stubborn. <laughs> you don't hold a grudge to you. Literally 20 years. Uh, yeah. Well, I started, <laughs> uh, let's see. I, I went to a few games during those 20 bad years, but it was only to see individual ball players from the other team. So Rod Carew or somebody would come into town, I'd go to see that. Yeah. I went to see uh, the great Walenda walk a, a wire across the top of the stadium. So important <laughs> events like that, I stayed with them, but yeah, I, I, just lost, I didn't read, um, I and still haven't read any box scores. I gave that up when the Braves left in 65. Wow. So you mean in 1982, when the Brewers were, were in the World Series, you were still a holdout? Yes, I did go to one game, the, uh, the championship game, the, the pennant winning game. Mm -hmm. um, my wife and I went, and we got standing room tickets. Mm -hmm. I only decided about half an hour before game time that I was going to go. And um, so we did, we parked near National Avenue and walked down and right before the game, right before the opening pitch, we were able to get standing room tickets. And that was an exciting game. If you Best game I've ever been to. You probably have World Series game four, 1957 is your best game, Bob, but that was my best baseball game ever. It was, good. It was exciting. Yeah. But I still didn't get back into baseball in general at that time. Maybe if they had won the back. World Series, it would have been a life-changing experience for me. But when did you start writing your book on the Braves? Is that when you got back into baseball? 1986. Okay. Yep. Yeah. I got back into it by researching it, basically. Hmm. Yeah. I've had a few people say, you know, what are you missing about baseball? I said nothing between reading and researching and writing for Saber. It, I, I've got a level of baseball, kind of a level of baseball I enjoy a lot. So I, 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 I canceled my subscription to MLB Network just because it was, I, I call the New York Yankee or New York Met Network because if the Yankees or Mets are at home when they're doing a home game, you know, date in their Thursday day games, there's always a New York ballpark, you know, show other teams and, so I just got to the point where I cancel it and I, I'm not going to miss it. Although Apple adding two games on Friday nights will help me see baseball. But, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I, um, I'm Dave, I'm kind of like you. I'm not sure where I'm at on going back yet. It's, uh, um, it's, uh, 
uh, even supporting minor league baseball, uh, uh, organized minor league baseball, not like the milkmen who are independent. You know, when you see how these players have been treated and everything, all we're doing is putting money in the damn owner's pockets and these players are just treated so badly and paid so poorly. It's just, it's unconscionable, but they have that uh, wonderful anti, uh, or they, they can do anything they want because of the, what's the, the antitrust. Antitrust yeah. law that protects them, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I think it's still, I'll, I'll miss the everydayness. Like it's not so much, you can still find games to go to, but just to have the background noise of the game, um, it, you know, that was there when you need it. Like, I, I think Tom Boswell used to talk about it. Yeah, you know, you, you know, your everyday life can't be all heart attacks and heart issues and, you know, you need some joy in your life. And it's just nice to be able to have that. And, um, but yeah, most of the fans like that I see at the ballpark um, here in Milwaukee, you know, they, they just want to party out in the parking lot and tailgate and um, they might find something else. I don't know. If they get back by May, June, when they can start tailgating outside, they may. Yeah, you know. the weather's better. Yeah. yeah. And that goes know. back Good to night. Good yeah. night, fellow Sabres. Do we, do we know the next book? For Sabre? Yeah. I haven't picked out a book because I'm not sure if the season was starting. Because once the season starts, um, I don't think there's too much interest in the book club. I think we need to Maybe a uh, short have an in-person meeting. How about a baseball short story? A baseball short story? Yeah. That would be excellent. Well, you mentioned that, you know, a short story would be good. I think yeah. so. I, I, that'd be great if there was a... Uh, a few short stories out there that they make for great conversations. W.P. Yeah. Kinsella wrote some great stuff. You want to look something up, Bob, in that? Thing? Yeah, because that's right. You mentioned that a few times. Um, the Thrill of the Grass? Yeah. Is that, that think, yeah. The, the, the one story in that that I think is absolutely fantastic is how I got my nickname. Mm -hmm. I think it's just a tremendous piece of writing. Maybe we should do, I, I, I could see like discussing, you know, suggesting people read that and discussing it maybe in in-person meeting. Mm -hmm. I don't know, what do you think, Dennis? And and it, so a couple of you, like Wally, I don't know if you'd make an in-person meeting or. Pretty difficult, to, I'm 300 miles plus away. Yeah. <laughs> but it, I, I plan on trying it so, uh, as soon as, as soon as we, I, we get that way and it, and it happens to work out, I wanna get down. Um, meet you guys in person yeah um, where are we at on that um we're probably gonna i'm gonna try and do a live meeting in may i was gonna look at trying to do it in april but i have a son coming down here for 10 days in april and i haven't figured out when yet so i'm just not planning a trip back in april so i'm looking at sometime in may one of my thoughts are i've just written a bio project for uh saber on willie miller maybe getting Willie Miller and his nephew, Ryan Rollinger to come in because these are former major leaguers from the area that talk about their game. Uh, and I'm open for all kinds of ideas. Uh, you know, we, going live again, it's, I got to start thinking, how do we do live and how do I get speakers and, and all that sort of thing. So suggestions would be greatly appreciated. So, yeah. So I'm I've looking for- I've got a question about these short stories. Are they fiction? Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. Yes. But uh, the one that I mentioned, how I got my nickname, combines history, fact, factual stuff with fiction. It's a, it's a fantasy kind of story, but it, it uh, incorporates Bobby Thompson's famous home run and the whole situation surrounding that. <laughs> and uh, I think it's hilarious. Yeah. Um, Baseball players always had reputations of being less than educated. I a well-deserved reputation, I think, from some of these guys. But, um, but this one, it, it's just different than anything else I've read. And that was in The Thrill of the Grass? Yeah, that's the name of the book. I'm sure you can find it online, that, that story. Everything in the world is on there somewhere. So. <laughs> I, think we, I buy used books on eBay. Sometimes you can get them new, 
sometimes you buy them used mm -hmm. and yeah. they're really cheap. I used to have a copy of that book. I'm not sure if I still do. I have one. Yeah. I'm sure you do, Bob. Uh, anyway, it's a great story. Yeah. I, I kind of like that idea, doing something fiction and different. Hmm. Interesting idea. You want to send an email out to some of the, the group and get some feelings on that, Mary? We could, yeah. Let's see what people think. Why not? Yeah. Yeah, although those who normally respond, I think somewhere here, Wally does, Dave's good at responding, Bob is, Larry, the people who respond are kind of here. So I don't know. Yeah. We got a phone number caller out here, but I don't know who that is. So I have a question for Bob if he's open to it. To it. It's sort of related. Bob, how, how would you, you as an author, how would you react to the idea of, of a, a short story that has re real people, real, real players and personalities, but because of the fact that they're, you know, it's ancient history, a hundred years ago, the author has to, or takes liberties and fills in the blanks and speculates about certain events that, that lead to conclusions that are real. Um, I ask that question because I, I toy with this idea with a, a certain, a couple of players that played semi-pro ball uh, back in the early 1900s in, in Sheboygan, my hometown. But I don't know. I don't know a lot about uh, certain details. But I know the, I know how things turn out. And so I, every once in a while, I think instead of just writing up this this biography or biographical sketch on a purely factual basis, I I could add some some interesting speculation based on reasonable assumptions. But I don't know, is that a liberty that the people would find offensive or, um, and I no. ask you as an author. No, that's it's not. It's been that. done. It sounds good. It's been done. Yeah, particularly if it's called a book, you know, it's, it, this is a fiction, fictional story would do it also. Do you have, do you have any, any authors that have done that? I'd like to check so, them out. Yeah, the, um, I forget the author. There's, uh, Bob had recommended a book on Christy Mathewson called The Celebrant. Celebrant. And it's, it's fictional. But it's 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 actually in Esquire's top 100 book list. Um, I thought I, I loved it, but um, it was part. It, the research was actually really well done yeah. and amazing. But the main characters were uh, fictional, so interwove historical fiction with you know history. Yeah. I don't know what it, you you read it, Bob. I think yeah. right. Yeah. I thought it was really good. Yeah, me too. The, there's so a that's, book. A good, that's a good you know, example. Who's the, author, who's the author? It's called The Celebrant, but who's the author? It's called The Celebrant. I can find the book. Another another fictional book out there is uh, I never If I Never Get Back by Daryl Brock. Oh, Brock, yeah. Which was written about uh, uh, the 1869 Cincinnati Reds and a time transfer of a person from, and that book is probably written in the 80s. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 And it was a good way to learn about baseball from that day. It was really very well done. So, I have a friend who, who took a shot at that. I'm not so sure it flew that well, but um, okay. I'll check these out. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Our, our next meeting, we've got um, uh, on the 24th, Bob Kendrick from the baseball, Negro League Baseball Museum. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard him talk. He's, I, I'm looking forward to him. I've heard a lot of his podcasts. We're, we're going to talk, obviously, about Buck going in, uh, but the Negro League players are made to Hall of Fame this year. And also talk about this is a big year in the Hall of Fame. Uh, at least it should have been a big year. You know, Jackie's, it's the 75th anniversary of Jackie breaking the color line. And, of course, right now, it doesn't look like we're going to have any ball games on April 15th, but they're going to celebrate the pioneers of every ball club um, uh, this year. So it's, it's a, it's an interesting year at the museum. I thought so it'd be a good meeting to have. And, and Bob's always so, uh, I always said, you can see, you can hear the smile in his voice. He's always so upbeat. He, he's a wonderful ambassador for the ball game. He learned from Buck, I think a lot, but he's, he's very, very good. So he's on the 24th. And if anybody yeah, has thanks. ideas for a live meeting in May, send them to me. I always can use, use the ideas. Yeah. Thanks so much for arranging him. Yeah. That'll, That'll be nice. So here's the celebrant.
Okay. And it's written oh. by Eric Rolf Greenberg. Greenberg. Okay. Thank you. I highly recommend. And this is The Thrill of the Grass. It's really a, a very fast read. It's short. Mm. W.P. Kinsella. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks to Bob. He suggested both of these. Yeah. Good. Good group. Good meeting. Yeah. It's always nice. Yeah. Very nice to see your faces and and talk about baseball. Good to see you all. And good night, night everybody. Uh, Dennis, you just do an excellent job on the monthly newsletter. Can't imagine it being any better than it is. Well, I I, I appreciate that, Dave. I uh, I enjoy doing it. But then I have people contributing articles. I just have to kind of make them fit on pages and stuff. And 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 uh, uh, and. I try to do the links and everything. So I spend a lot of time on that part. Uh, don't write as much, but uh, would like to find more time for that. But I, I enjoy the newsletter. It's just something to keep us connected. Uh, uh, and But I don't get a lot of feedback. I, I've got one feedback on the, the, the survey question about the DH. It was Dave, Dave, I think you responded, I think. Or, yep. And that's it. So and I disagree. Uh, but. I like. Well, I think I told you my husband Joe was so yeah. impressed. Is so impressed with your newsletter. Yeah, it yeah, looks I'm, nice. So. I'm getting better and better. I'm, I you know I prided myself as an accounting type that there wasn't a thing I didn't know in Excel, which is a lie because there's always something to learn in Excel, and I'm getting as good in Word now as I used to be in Excel, and, and so it's like I, I feel like I'm a uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm losing my mind because the accounting types never wanted to say Excel was I mean that that Word was any good, so. Uh, yeah, but, I'm more comfortable with the, with Excel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but yeah, I, so I I look forward to it. And I, I there's stuff going in the newsletter all month long. If something pops up, I'm throwing it in. At least getting the basics in there. So I so I, I'm enjoying doing it. So yeah. So thank you, Dave. I appreciate you saying that. Yep. Well, good night. Good, good night, night, guys. See you on the 24th. See you then. Yeah. Thank you. Good.